Rupa had a lot of medical experience. He had stopped studying just short of becoming a doctor. So he was picking glass out of people's backs. He found some boric acid and a little water and it was a powder and it turned out that was a very good thing for the burns. But they, they dealt with people there. Then they took a lot of them back to the Levishit with them and kept some of them for a year. So this was all part of, part of his, his formation. I think it's fundamental. I begin my biography with the moment the bomb was dropped into Hiroshima and he's there below. And the burst, the spiritual explosion that is producing him at the moment he stops and sees the watchtower stop at 8.15. The tremendous energy that results helps cure 150 sick who show up at his hospital thanks to a bottle of boric acid that he finds. Assuredly, it was in such moments of tragedy that we felt God most near to us. And this seems to have marked him very much. Um, a kind of feeling of having been, been close to the end of the world, hmm? uh, to have been present to, to a, a, one of the most dramatic events of the history of mankind. Um, that that remained with Arupe, I think. Ever after that, he, he could never stand violence. He would just, he'd say, you know, violence, you know, no, to be, to be avoided no matter what the cost. The 1960s erupt in a different kind of explosion. Social upheavals that alter the course of world events more extensively, perhaps, than even the atomic bomb. Ecclesiastical upheavals are triggered within the Catholic Church by the election of Pope John XXIII, who throws open church windows to the winds of change. His encyclical, Pacem in Terrace, will address not just Catholics, but all men of goodwill, demonstrating fresh openness to the world. Only 90 days after his election, he unexpectedly invites all the bishops from around the globe to gather in Rome to re-examine the stance of the Catholic Church in a changing world. This 21st Ecumenical Council, the first in almost a century, becomes a major news event. Considered one of the most important councils in Catholic Church history, Vatican II saw 2,400 bishops and other prelates in 168 sessions from October 1962. The council produced 16 documents designed to modernize the role of the church in world affairs. The Council would meet in four sessions over four years. Its crowning document, the Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World, would address itself without hesitation not only to the sons and daughters of the Church and to all who invoke the name of Christ, but to the whole of humanity. The Council's decrees will inspire and guide Pedro Arupe as Jesuits become leaders in the implementation of the Church's modernization. Pope John XXIII dies before the council is completed and is succeeded by Pope Paul VI, who oversees the conclusion of the council. Shortly after the death of Pope John XXIII, the Superior General of the Jesuits, sometimes called the Black Pope, Father Janssens also dies and Jesuits from around the world gather to elect his successor. Among the gathering Jesuits was the president of Fordham University, Father Vincent O'Keefe. In 1965, we had what we call a general congregation. This is our highest legislative body in the society. And so it's a meeting of Jesuits from all around the world, Jesuits who are elected in their own province to go to the big meeting in Rome. Immersed in the spirit of the Second Vatican Council, Jesuits face their own challenges of change. Priorities need to be examined. Commitment to justice rises for special consideration. 
On the third ballot, the general congregation elects Pedro Arupe to be their superior general on May 22, 1965, and goes on to pass wide-ranging reforms. Arupe will be thrust unprepared into leadership that requires him to transform the ranks of nearly 30,000 Jesuits to address a new world order. Father Arupe's first official words as general were a quotation from Jeremiah. Ah, 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 I don't know how to speak. And it sounds strange, you know, this is a man uh, fluent in seven languages. But when you read through the rest of the quotation, you realize that Pedro Arupe is saying that he really doesn't know how to speak, but the Lord will talk for him, and the Lord will teach him how to speak. And he certainly did. He was a very articulate spokesman throughout his whole life. The heart and soul of that message was his basic option did not oppose the church to the world, but rather it considered the church in the world. The message of spiritually engaging the world promoted by John XXIII and the Second Vatican Council, as well as by the Jesuit General Congregation, would nevertheless prove to be a challenge for Pedro Arupe. Uh, I accepted what the society gives to me, uh, elected me as general, and uh, the first thing to come to my mind is a big cross. That is, I think I was bound to suffer in the rest of my life very much, because I suppose always a general has to suffer. But in this condition of the church, I think it's something special, which has a tremendous changes so many affections, so many problems, so much insecurity. But it's another aspect of the, to be a general, who is the source of great joy. And that is to have the possibility of knowing the society and the Jesuits from inside. Arupe will turn out to be an apt advocate of adapting the ministries of the Jesuits to the modern world. He is aware that finding God in all things and encountering Christ in the world are insights resulting from intense soul-searching on the part of Ignatius Loyola. As a novice master, he had immersed himself in the writings of the Jesuit founder. The profound spirituality he developed was based on the example of Loyola, whose passion was to discern the will of God in his life, a life that embraces the world he lives in. In 1965, the general congregation that elects Arupe concludes that the spirit of St. Ignatius calls for more active engagement in working for social justice. Arupe enthusiastically embraces this direction, but not all Jesuits will be happy with it. When he was elected general of the society, it was just before the last session, the most decisive session of that Vatican II Council. And he got extremely interested. He, he felt uh, that it was a turning point for the Catholic Church. The point uh, which was decisive for him in the Council was the opening to the world. Particularly, I think, he felt that uh, we had uh, to, to look at the world around us in a new way.